Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about confidence intervals. Um, now we've we talked about sampling, and what we're talking about here is whether or not you know we have a um, a plus or minus, or whether we can sorry whether we can create a plus or minus for a given mean. So we got a sample mean, and we're trying to uh, predict whether or not uh, you know that sample mean is a representative of the population mean, and really we know that there's some error. So therefore this error, we're going to create a lower bound than an upper bound uh, boundary that we say that we're 95% sure that the population mean will fall within. So we can really gain a lot of insight into, the, into these confidence intervals. And as an example, what we can do is we get a monthly revenue data. We can basically use the confidence interval to estimate future months revenues. That's assuming that there's no trend growth or nothing else adverse. We can basically say that we know the average is around, let's say, $100,000. Uh, we have steady growth or we have no growth, but we have the same amount that comes in. We know that next month's revenue should be approximately $100,000, give or take a little bit of amount. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on how these confidence intervals are generated. Now remember, when we have a point estimate, we're talking about, when we say the point estimate, in this case, we're basically referring to the mean, okay? So the point estimate of the population mean is the sample mean. So let's assume that this here is a sample mean. So the sample does give a good reliable estimate of the population mean, but we know that we're going to be off by some amount. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a confidence interval whereby we can actually uh, have some confidence that the population mean will lie in an area plus or minus of that point estimate, okay? And therefore, we are actually gonna create a formula that basically says, well, you're gonna take your point estimate, we're gonna do plus or minus a certain amount, and this is what we're gonna focus on, how we create this, um, this margin of error, this error, uh, the plus or minus boundary. Now we've already talked about the standard error. Uh, we know that that is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n from previous slides. But we haven't talked about a multiple or why that's even needed. So let's see what we're gonna do with regards to this. So what we're gonna first do is we talk about uh, creating a z value from a sampling di distribution, right? So we have a distribution of some sort and we talked about this z-score. Now the z-score is something that comes from our sample and we had spoken in a previous class that we have x bar minus mu, so this is x bar minus some, uh, um, some the population mean, divided by the uh, standard deviation, I'm sorry, divided by then the square root of n. Now the problem is, is that since the population standard deviation is never known, we call this a nuisance parameter. So in order to compensate for this, what we do is we can get rid of this sigma and we can populate it with S, which is our sample mean. And this is ultimately what we're looking for. We're looking to figure out how that works. Now, when we do that though, and we introduce two elements of the sample, we have the X bar, which is from the sample, and we have the standard deviation, which is from the sample, we've introduced a little bit more error. So in order to account for that error, we're gonna focus on this T distribution. Now the student's t distribution is very similar to the normal distribution, but we use it to estimate the z-score from the distribution when we've added that extra variability. In other words, the variability that comes from the sample is now in our mean and it's in our standard deviation from the z-score on the previous slide. So by doing that, we're going to account for that error a little bit different by instead of using a normal distribution, we're going to focus on a t distribution, but it looks very much like a normal distribution. So the graph on the right shows what the T distribution look, looks like. And the difference in the curves is based on this thing called the degrees of freedom. Now, the degrees of freedom is equivalent to one minus the number of observations. Now, it's a little bit mystical as to what this degrees of freedom is. And if we weren't online, I would show this in class. But if you wanna know about how one point is in relation to the other points, uh, I can measure a distance, right? So let's see, we're gonna use distance. So imagine that you have a class and you have four people or five people uh, in this class. And I wanna say a relative distance up, uh, away one point is from the other. Well, I can measure the distance and I can measure the distance between that point and another point and so forth. But 
what is my overall distance? You know, if I were to say, how far is point A away from the other points? And you say, well, which point? And what you need to do is you need to hold one point constant. And now I can measure all of the other points in relation to that point that is, that is required to stay still. And this is what we're referring to as the degrees of freedom. So in other words, if I have 30 elements in my, uh, or 30 observations in my sample, what I'm going to do is in order to understand the variability or the variance, I'm gonna keep one still, and I'm going to allow the others to be whatever they're going to be. Now we don't have to do anything. This is actually handled in this T distribution calculation. So uh, if we have 30 observations in a uh, sample, the degrees of freedom would be 29 because it's gonna be N minus one. Now, when we look at the T distribution with different degrees of freedom, we could see what this chart looks like. So the red line here shows degree of freedom five, while the blue line, which is a little bit harder to see, is basically a degree of freedom of 100. And the black dashed line, uh, I'm sorry, the blue line is degree of freedom 30. Then there's a green line, which is right above it, uh, which is uh, degrees of freedom of 100. And the black dashed line is the normal distribution. And you can see the more data you have, the more the T distribution resembles the normal distribution. And this is part of what we had discussed in the previous lecture, the, the central limit theorem that everything will tend to normal. And that's no different here for the T distribution. So remember, when we're looking to standardize a z-score right, through the formula, we can basically use x bar minus mu divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. But because we don't know this, we can actually replace it with s, which is our sample standard deviation. So this becomes this. And so therefore, our standardized t value using the t distribution is now represented by this formula instead of this formula. So they're very, very similar. The only difference is the standard, instead of using the standard deviation from the population, we're using the standard deviation from the sample. So now we can interpret the t-value as the number of standard errors the sample mean differs from the population mean, just like we did with the z-score from the previous uh, lecture. Now to use the t-distribution in Excel, we basically have these formulas. So uh, where we had uh, the norm.dist and norm.in, we have similar ones. We have t.dist and we have t.in. So if we choose the t.dist 0.24, we get a result of 0.5. Now, let's figure out what that means. Why did I do 24? This is the degrees of freedom. So it says here, assume we have a sample of 25 scores. So if we have a sample of 25 scores, the degrees of freedom is going to be 24. Now I put in zero because what I'm looking for, again, if you remember from the normal distribution, the uh, norm.dist, we plugged in a value and it would give us the area under the curve to the left, right? So if you recall, we would have something that looks like a normal distribution. That looks horrible, but it's gonna have to suffice. And here is my mean center point. So if I plug in zero, basically everything to the left should be about one half of the entire curve. And that is actually my result, 0.5. So the T distribution of zero with 24 degrees of freedom is 0.5. Now, if I put in the t-distribution one, again, 24 degrees of freedom, then it would be one out here. And we're basically trying to say that this is similar to one standard deviation away from the mean. So this would be my number one. And obviously it's gonna be greater than 50% because we had the 50% and then we added a little bit more. Now, if this was a normal distribution, we know that one standard deviation is by itself contains 68% of the data right? Well, if it contains 68%, that means that this, this side has about approximately 34%, because if we had put the one, the negative one here, we know that this entire middle area would be 60, uh, 68%. So one half of it would be 34. So if you take the 50% on this side, and you add 34% on this side, approximately, you end up with 84, and the number's actually 83. 
So it's very, very close. And that's what we would want to look for. We could do the same thing where we say, well, what if I want everything to the right, to the right of the curve, which would be this way, okay, instead of to the left. All we have to do is do one minus. We could do our T distribution from a given point. In this case, it's 1.5, which would be somewhere around here. This would be 1.5. And I'm looking for the area under this curve. I know this part here, so I'll just drag that up. So what would happen is we put 1.5 degrees of freedom 24, and that gives us a number. But that number would be everything that would be to the left of that 1.5. When I do 1 minus, it would give me the stuff to the right of that 1.5. And that's how we can find what's on the right side of the tail. Now, if you want to find what's on both tails from a particular area, so you're calculating the area in between, we could actually use the t.dist.2t, and it would give us that answer. So here, if I do two, so the two would basically be a negative two out here and a positive two out here. Obviously, we know that that's very small and if, on both tails. So what happens is, is that if you recall from the normal distribution, two standard deviations are approximately 95% of the data. So that means what's in the tail is approximately 5% of the data. And that is exactly what this number shows, 0.056, because it's giving us what's in the two tails. So uh, that's what you're looking for. Now, uh, I can do the reverse. I can do t.inv. In the t.inv, it's going to give me, uh, you put in a probability, and it tells you what number is associated with that. So we put in 95%. We want to know what's, what, at what point here on the curve would be 95% of the data, and that would be 1.71. If we do the two tails, where the two tails basically are at uh, you know five uh, two and a half percent each, because this is 0.95, that would be a little bit further at 2.06. And these are the key terms for this module. Now let me open up the next one. All right, I think I have to stop share and reshare again. Let's see if I can find it. That's not it. Again. Bear with me for one second. One, there's two. Let me see. Chapter 82. Share again. And there we go. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the confidence interval for this. So recall that we had said that there was going to be a multiple uh, that we add onto our sample mean, like we have here. So at this point, uh, we, we're gonna, we need to calculate this T multiple, which we learned from the previous slides. And then we just multiply it by the standard error of X bar, which we know from the previous slides are uh, S divided by the square root of N. So T values uh, are calculated in Excel using the T.inf.2T. You can use the regular T.inf or the T.inf, uh, uh, T .inf, the T.dist, if you're gonna do it that way, depending on which way you're going. But since we're looking for a confidence interval that is above and below the mean, we're going to use a two-tail probability. In chapter nine, we will use one tail. Uh, we'll have scenarios where we're only gonna use one tail. We don't, we don't just look at the two tails, we'll either look at the right or the left. So now what we've got is we're looking for the probability of being in the upper tail or in the lower tail regardless. And that's because, and the reason why is if you recall, we're looking for a confidence interval. So what happens is, is that here's my line and I have my center point, which is my mean, and then my confidence interval that I'm creating is basically going to be, if we were looking for population means, the population means of say 1,000 samples or 2,000 samples will, will actually follow a T distribution or a normal, what looks like a normal distribution that says that 95% of the means will fall 
So 95% of all of the sample means, if you took them together, will fall within this area. And so only two and a half percent of the time you know, with your sample means will they will it be below this number and two and a half percent of the time will it be in this tail or above that number. Okay. Now, how do we do this in Excel? So from the data set on the right, now so there's 50 test scores, but I only showed 20. So here are all my scores. We're going to compute a confidence interval. So the first thing we do is we calculate the mean, and that's 84.38. We will then calculate the sample standard deviation, that's 9.89. And again, that's from the SD, uh, STDEV uh, form function in Excel. So now what we do is we calc compute the standard error of the mean. We're just going to take S, which is our standard uh, deviation. So we've got this being here. And I'm going to divide by the square root of N so that my square root of the sample size, and that will give me this standard error of the mean. I'm looking for a 95% confidence level, so my alpha is going to be 0.05. That's how I get the 0.05. So the only thing I had now need to do is I need to compute the T multiple. I have all of the pieces. So to compute the T multiple, I'll do t.inv.2t. I will say it's 0.05 for my alpha level. And then the 49 comes from the fact that the degrees of freedom, which I've listed here as 49, is 1 minus the sample size up there. And so in your Excel samples, you'll see that I've done all that for you. Computing this out, we then have 84.38 is our mean. This t.inv.2t is going to be computed as 2.010. You can see that in the formula that I did here. We then take our 9.89 times uh, divided by the square root of 50, and we will end up with two numbers, again, because it's a plus and minus, 84.38 minus this quantity, and 84.38 plus this quantity, and you end up with 81.57, and you end up with 87.19. And what that means is that if I was drawing this line out, and my sample mean is denoted as this here, which is 84.38. That means that I will have my lower bound here at 81.57 and my upper bound here, not drawn to scale terribly, at 87.19. And that basically means, again, my interpretation is, is that 95% of, 95 of samples will actually fall within that range. In other words, the, the, the sample means would fall within that range. Or in other words, there's a 95% chance that your population mean will fall in that range. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, if you do, just, uh, just give me a little bit of an alert. No. Take care of it that way. Okay, now I have a problem. I can't find my mouse. Okay, so I'm gonna try to stop share. Go. All right. Oops. All right, bear with me one second. Share. Okay. Okay, just pause because I can't do anything here. There we go. Okay. All right, so now we can compute a confidence interval for many different things. So this is one that is not as widely used, but is still important, and it's in your book is the confidence estimate for a total. So what we mean by that is I'm gonna have a total, I'm gonna add up, let's say everybody's salary in a company, and that becomes my total. Well, if I took a sample of my employees, I wanna know really what the, if, what the total you know, might be uh, for everybody if I don't have everybody's salary handy or if I don't wanna compute everybody, just to get an idea of what the full, um, of what the full piece might be. So the way we do that is this t hat here that you see is 
the t hat is the projected total or my predicted total it's going to be equal to capital n which is the total number of people or the total number of my population divided by my sample i'm going to multiply that by ts now this is the uh, sample total that i have and what we'll find is that that is basically going to be equal to n times x bar which is my um, which is the sample uh, mean that I have. Now that makes sense, is if you take a sample mean and you multiply it by the total number of observations, you're gonna end up getting what the total approximately should be. So that being said, the expected value of this total uh, is going to be the actual total itself, it should be. And the standard error of the total is actually gonna be a combination of things. It's gonna be the uh, number of items that we have, the total number of items, times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And therefore, we can estimate the standard error of the total as n times the square root, uh, standard error of x bar. Because again, that's what we computed before. And so therefore, we end up with the t hat, which is the predicted t hat that we've got, plus or minus the t multiple. This is from the t distribution. And we're going to multiply this by the standard error of the total. So let's take a look at an example. So here I've got you know, the uh, 100 samples of customer uh, revenue uh, accounts. Uh, 17 are shown. We calculate the mean and the standard deviation as well as the standard error and the T multiple. We did that on the previous slide, so I won't go into detail on that. We include a total estimate where T hat is equal to N times X bar, where N is the total population. How many total uh, what's the total of our population? This sample is only 100, but we have a population of, let's say, 10,000 you know, in, in total. So the total estimate is going to end up being $26 million because the average was $2,600, the average for this sample. So what we want to know is we want to know if this was our total estimate, this $26 million, we want to know what the confidence interval would be for that total. So we compute the same thing, t.inv.2t. 0.05, because again, we want a 95% confidence level. 99 is our degrees of freedom, and that's because we have 100 samples. So we're doing um, minus one uh, for the degrees of freedom. Uh, and then we multiply it by the standard error of the total, which we had uh, the formula from the slide before. That standard error of the total is gonna be 1.43 uh, million. By using this, we will then create a confidence interval for the total. So it's gonna be plus or minus this 26 million, and we get 23 million and 28 million for the upper bound, 23 for the lower bound, 28 for the upper bound. When you're doing samples like this, that's one thing you should look at. You should basically look at um, whether or not you have a number below and a number above, and they should be equal to each other. Uh, and it should make some sense, in other words, uh, it should be close to whatever the number point estimate is. It shouldn't be super far, unless, of course, your standard error itself was far. Now, we can compute a confidence interval for a ratio or a proportion. So what example might we see? So let's say uh, we're in news reports when reporters or network voters say 46% um, of the people approve of the job of their senator. This is a ratio, 46 out of 54. Developing a confidence interval provides a margin of error. This is the margin of error for these proportions. So the point estimate for the target of the proportion is p hat, okay? And the opposite is one minus p hat. So from above, our p hat, which is the point estimate, is equal to 0.46, and therefore one minus p hat is equal to 0.54. So again, it's the number of people, the percent of people that approve of the job and the percent of people that don't approve, just one minus that number. So to calculate our confidence interval, we're gonna use an equation similar to the ones we had before. But the difference here is we use a Z multiple instead of a T multiple. And the reason is simple. In this, we're not necessarily using a sample mean, we're just computing uh, what the percentage was, the, the percentage of the, um, the percentage of the uh, respondents that say yes or no or anything like that. Whereas before we were using the sample mean and a standard deviation. You're gonna notice in the formula down below, we're not using that sample standard deviation at all. In this formula down here, there is no sample standard deviation. 
and therefore we don't need to use the t-multiple. If you recall, when we first opened this up, the t-multiple was really used because we had two uh, specific uh, elements from the sample. We had the sample mean and we had the sample standard deviation. So it introduced a little bit more error. And that's ultimately what we're seeing here is we're seeing that we don't need the t-multiple, but in this case, we will need a z-multiple because we don't have that extra error that's coming from the sample by using a, the sample standard deviation. And that's actually what this slide talked about. I just skipped it. I just did it earlier. So you can, you can read that slide if you need to, but I, I just explained that. So on the right, we have a survey of 500 people based on the president's approval rating. In this case, the approval was found to be 55%. We want to know the confidence interval for the proportion. So we bring back our formula, p hat plus or minus the z multiple times the standard error of p hat. In this case, the p hat we've already computed as 55% of 500 people. So we have 275 approved, 225 disapproved. Uh, the sample size is 500. So my sample proportion is 0.55. So the 1 minus p will be 0.45. We'll use that in a minute. So we'll take a look at the norm.s.inv because I'm going to compute the, the inverse of the normal distribution, which is, I put 0.975. The reason I put 0.975, and it's noted here in this yellow box, is because we're looking for both sides or both tails. So I need the left tail and the right tail. So that means I need to be a little bit more strict, and I'm going to cut the proportion down to 2.5% uh, from 5%. So let's just see what's happening there and why I'm doing that. So if I were to create a normal distribution here, this is my normal distribution. Now remember the t.inv is actually going to give us what is to the left of any given point. So what happens is, is that we, we will remember hopefully that if we were to take 95%, that means it gives us everything from this point all the way over to the left. So therefore, I really don't have the 2.5% on this side and the 2.5% on this side. I really only have the 5% on this side. Now, if I were to move this over to 2.5% this way, so instead of going for 95%, I go to 97.5%. Now I know basically the size of the table. I know that this number is equivalent to a number out here, which would give us the 2.5% here and the 2.5% there. So that's why we're using this 0.975. We need to cut the alpha in half so that we can get the appropriate value of this uh, norm.s.inv, and that's what we use. And in this case, it gives us 1.96. So to compute the standard error of p hat, we basically take the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. Just plugging in the numbers, we will actually get 0.022. So now you have 0.55 plus 1.9 plus or minus 0.196 times 0.022. And that'll give us a 0.50 uh, to 0.59 margin. If you multiply these two numbers together, 1.96 and 0.022, you end up with 0.0435. This 0.0435, rounded here to 4.4%, is what we call the margin of error because it is what's being added to this 55%. So you might be asked on a homework question or on a, um, in a homework question or on, a, on an exam question saying that the uh, standard error that, that uh, does a, uh, ca a candidate reaches uh, 52% uh, is it, is it likely based on uh, certain parameters, based on the total sample size that we have that less than 50% will actually, actually like their candidate? Something along those lines. So it's looking for where that boundary is. And if you find the margin of error, you'll know, in the, like in this case, you have 0.5064 as the lower bound, meaning that you're 95% sure that over 50% of the folks uh, approve the job of the president in this case. So let's take a look at confidence intervals between means. Uh, again, does anybody have any questions? Oops. Cancel that. 
Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I'll move on. So now let's understand what happens if we want to compare differences. So I have two samples, sample A and sample B, or class A and class B. And we want to see if the means are really different. So if each sample confidence interval, um, each sample confidence interval estimates where the population mean will fall. So if we have two samples that are from the same exact population, then the population mean should fall within both confidence intervals. So you have class A, class B, let's assume I'm teaching two classes, and I give a set of tests. Ideally, I know there's gonna be some error in terms of the sample means, they're not gonna be the same, but if I computed a confidence interval, it might be clear that the confidence interval here should be somewhat similar or overlapping to the confidence interval for my other class. And as long as they overlap, it does mean that the two samples come from the same population and that the only differences that you see are due to some random chance. Now, what if the confidence intervals don't uh, overlap? Well, let's say we were looking, uh, it means that they, they actually come from a different population. So let's say we have voters from two different countries. The confidence intervals might not overlap because the population parameter would be estimated differently for each sample. In other words, if you have something from say the United States and something from France, and in terms of their, the, the average perception of say happiness, and you see the confidence interval, you've calculated the point estimate, calculate the confidence interval, and they don't overlap, it basically means that the two populations are different. Not that there are different humans and aliens and stuff, but that they have different beliefs, that uh, their, their perception of what's going on is different. There is no statistical chance that they are the same or that the answers are the same. In two classes, if I class A and class B, I give them the same test, they should be the same. They should have some overlap. If they don't, it means that something was radically different from the class. There's only a 5% chance that they would have been different, in this case, if we're using a 95% confidence interval. Uh, there's only a 5% chance that they would be off, having nothing to do with anything in the class. So how do we compute this? So what we do is we're gonna compute the two means, but this time what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna subtract the two means and we wanna see if the difference between the two are actually different. So if I look at the difference here, this is x1 bar minus x2 bar. I'm computing the difference between the two means. And I keep my t multiple, and now I'm gonna compute the standard error of this difference. Now the standard error of this difference is a little bit complicated. So it's what's called, we're gonna to have to do what's called the pool of, this, of the uh, standard error. So the way we do that is, I lost my mouse again. I apologize, I gotta redo this. There we go. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the pooled estimate of the standard deviation, that's this SP. I'm gonna show you that down here. And we're gonna multiply it by the square root of one over N minus, uh, one over N one plus one over N two. This is just the sample size of, uh, in sample one and the sample size in, in sample two. This one's a little bit more complicated. And that's why I did it for you in the, um, in the worksheet for you. So you have N one minus one, times the standard times the variance of the first sample. So S squared here, uh, this is S1. This is your standard deviation of sample one squared, which is the same thing as the variance. If you remember from our first slides, S uh, is equal to the square root of S squared, and S squared was the variance, okay? So that was the, that was the variance, and we actually had denoted that as sigma squared is the variance, which would then be equal to sigma only if we took the square root of sigma squared. So we, here we have the variance of sample one, the variance of sample two, easy to compute. We just multiply them by n1 minus one and n2 minus one respectively. We then divide this by n1 plus n2 minus two. Now why do we do n1 plus n2 minus two? Well, N1 plus N2 is the total number of observations in sample one and sample two. Now, if you remember, we were actually doing something with kind of degrees of freedom in the previous slides. 
what we're doing is we're subtracting one from each. That's kind of what we did in this little uh, parenthesis and this little parenthesis. So since we subtract one from each, we're doing minus two. That gives us this SP. This is the uh, pooled estimate of the standard deviation. And it's what we will use up here in this uh, formula. Once we compute that, we will get our standard error of the difference, and then we can use it. We can plug everything back in and see what it looks like. So here, I have two uh, 20 inch sample salaries, 20 are shown from department one, department two. So I have 20 in total, 20 in total, total number of observations is 56. My degrees of freedom is going to be calculated as N1 minus one, N2 minus one, and add them together, which is your N1 plus N2 minus two that we just talked about. So it's 54. So you just take the total number of observations and subtract two, the two being one, one for the department one, one for department two. We compute the average for X bar one and X bar two. Here's our two numbers. I compute the difference. The difference is 8,827. So the difference between the two is 8,827. And what we want to do is we want to see what the confidence interval is for that. So based on that, we're going to compute our T multiple, which is 0.95, uh, 54. So I get a value of 2. So in this case, I'm doing my t.inf.2t.0.5 for my 0.05 alpha, 54, because that's my degrees of freedom. And that gives me the 2.005. The difference again was 8827. Now I'm just going to plug the items into this formula above. So I've got the x1 minus x2 is 8827. The t multiple is this 2.05. So I'm just left with the standard error of the difference between the two means. So we calculate as the standard pool as 32,786. Now that's done here in the spreadsheet for you here. So this is the standard error of X1 bar minus X2 bar. It's a little hard to show here. So you can take a look at the Excel worksheet uh, for calculating the standard error. And then what we do is we plug the numbers in. So we take our 8827 plus 2.005 and we multiply that by 8763. I just rounded this number here. This equals 8827 plus 17568, which is this number here. And you end up with a confidence interval of negative 8740 to 26,935. Now, why is this confidence interval for the difference important? Well, it's important because I don't have a slide for it, so I got it here. If the confidence interval spans zero, that means that zero falls between here and here. In other words, if one of them is negative and the other one's positive, uh, for the most part. So if that's the case, then that means that there is a probability that the difference between the two samples are zero. And therefore, it means that they come from the same population. So that there's no difference between the two samples, they must come from the same population. And that's ultimately what we're looking for when we compute the difference between, uh, for differences between means, if we compute the confidence interval of the difference between the means. Now we can do a confidence interval for difference between proportions in the same way, just as we calculated the confidence interval for the difference between means. Now, let's say we have two samples where the proportions represent success, failure, yes, no, approve, disapprove. Our formula again is similar to our proportion confidence interval, which is P1 minus P2 hat, plus or minus, again, I'm using the Z multiple, not a T multiple, and I multiply it by the standard error of P hat one and P hat two. So from the previous slides, we had shown that we were using, why we use the Z multiple, okay? And let's not forget that the, the difference between the proportions is calculated by difference of success ratio in sample one versus the difference in success ratio for sample two. That's what we're computing here. Our standard error for this will require a bit more from both samples. We're going to basically take the square root of p hat one times one minus p hat one over n one, this is over the number of observations, plus p hat two, the number of successes in the second sample, times one minus p hat two, which is the number of failures, in the second sample, divided by the number of observations in the second sample. We take the square root of that, and that gives us our standard error. 
So let's take a look at the example. So on the right, we have 300 tests of success and fail in two trials. Only 20 are shown. So one stands for success, zero stands for failure. So we're, let's say we have some equipment that we're testing out and we run it and it succeeds and it succeeds and it fails and it succeeds and it fails and so forth. And that's what we're looking at. So we compute the success rate by the total number of successes. In this case, the successes for trial one was 56% and trial two was 64%. So now we're going to see if uh, we're going to compute the confidence interval for these differences. So P1 hat minus P2 hat plus or minus the Z multiple times the standard error. Let's go through some of what we computed before. The Z multiple is norm.s.inv 0.975. Because again, this is a two-tailed test for the Z multiple. Remember before when we used the T test, we used the dot 2T. Here we do not have a norm.s.inv.2T, so we have to cut the alpha in half, and we get 1.96. The P1 hat minus P2 hat is just negative 0.08, and now we calculate the standard error. Here's our formula, the square root of P1 hat times one minus P1 hat, which is 0.56 times 0.44 divided by the number of observations, which is 300, and then P2 hat times one minus P2 hat, which is 0.64 and 0.36, divided by 300. When you add them together, take the square root, and we get 0.04. So now we end up with our confidence interval for the proportion difference here as negative 0.08, which we got from here. This negative 0.08 is right there, plus 1.96, which is the norm.s.inv, times the 0.04, which we computed over here. You'll notice here that we have negative 0.002 and negative 0.158. And that basically means that we did not cross zero. I don't have one negative, one positive. Therefore, it means that the two trials were different. They come from a different population or something was different between trial one and trial two because it did not span zero. There is a very low probability that the difference was zero. Remember, there's a 95% probability that we have here, between here and here. So these are the formulas here for the confidence intervals. I've put them here for you, and these are on the worksheet. Now let's take a look at the last one. If I can find it for you. Uh, there we go. Share. Okay. Confidence intervals are basically used, uh, are a function of three things. I'm sorry. They're a function of three things. The data that we have, and the key there is the variance. Now, recall that the variance is, is related to that standard deviation. So that's a critical piece here. Um, the variance of the data is going to have an effect on the confidence interval. The more variance you have in your sample, the more wider your confidence interval is going to be. So it affects the standard error. The larger the error in the sample, the wider the confidence interval. We also can manipulate it by the confidence level. So we can have a 99% confidence level, which will be shorter or narrow than a confidence level such as 95 or 90%. The more data you have, the more narrow the confidence level will be. This is because increasing the data will increase the accuracy because variability will reduce. So for example, if I end up with a, uh, if I end up with you know, 1,000 elements in the data set and I end up doing another one with 10,000, what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to have a more narrow confidence level because it's going to end up being uh, better because we've introduced more data and therefore my standard error will reduce. So from the previous formulas or confidence interval, we have the same form. The confidence interval is equal to the point estimate plus or minus T multiple times the standard error or confidence interval equals point estimate plus or minus the t multiple times the square, uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So it's basically the same formula. The right side of the plus or minus indicates how much we want our confidence interval to span. So at least in one, at least, um, in one direction, since it's plus minus. So if we wanted to have the confidence interval to be plus or minus 10, 
we would want the right side of the formula after the plus or minus to be equal to 10. So think of it this way. If you're looking at the television and you're seeing these poles and they have a margin of error of 3.2, you might ask the question, well, what if I wanted a margin of one or margin of two? We would look at the right side of that plus minus and try and set that equal to two and solve for either n to give us the number of items we need or can we, which you really can't manipulate the standard deviation, or you can say that we would have needed a standard deviation here of a certain amount. So this becomes the key that we're looking for, this t multiple times s divided by the square root of n equals 10. So we can solve for n to get the sample size required to obtain a confidence interval of plus or minus 10. And one of your homework problems has this. Well, we're gonna do a little bit of algebra here. So let's assume that we want a confidence level of plus or minus b, where b is the confidence level. So that's our plus or minus 10 that we were talking about. We have t multiple times s divided by the square root of n. And what we really are looking for is we're looking for what size n do we need to get this confidence inter interval. So we do a little algebra. We take the square root of n, bring it over to this side. And then what we'll do is we can divide by b on this side. We can then square both sides to get rid of the square root. And we end up with the t multiple times s uh, over b and we square it and that will equal n. So even though we don't have this formula sample size yet uh, to know the standard deviation, we could estimate the population standard deviation by using a z multiple and rewrite the formula as possible. So if you, have, you don't have the t multiple because you don't have a size sample that large, we would just simply invert it to a z multiple, uh, which we can compute because that z multiple would be just based on the probability. So we would say like 0.95 or 0.975 times whatever the standard deviation is divided by b and square it and we would get n. So let's say we wanted to obtain a confidence interval of plus or minus 0.4 where our confidence level is 95% with a population standard deviation of 1.693. So we're given this population standard deviation. Now, if you only had a sample standard deviation, you could use it. It would be, it's definitely possible to use it. Because uh, it's a good estimate. In Excel, the z multiple though is going to be 0.95, which would be norm.s.inv, 0.975, because it's two tail, which gives us 1.96. This 1.96 keeps popping up because it is two standard deviations away from the mean. So the problem above gives us a population standard deviation of 1.693, which is this up here. So we have that. So once we have that, we can start plugging in all the numbers. We take the 1.96, multiply it by 1.693. We divide it by 0.4, which is that B from above. That's this confidence interval that we're trying to obtain. We square it. When we do that, we end up with 8.29 squared, which equals 68.72. So, and we have to round upward because we need that extra observation. So we need at least 69 observations. So this is how we can compute the necessary sample size. Now, what's really important to know is that as you increase, as you decrease uh, the uh, confidence level, so you say uh, from 0.4 to a one, a confidence level of 0.2 to a one, a confidence level of 0.1, that number increases tremendously, this N. You need a lot larger samples to get a smaller confidence interval. And basically, we can do the same thing for the other calculations. So what I've done here is I've done the algebra for you already. If you want a sample size for estimating a population mean, that's what this is, that's what we did. The sample size for estimating a proportion is basically z multiple divided by b squared times the p estimate times one minus p estimate. So this would be like the 55% and the 45%, but everything else is the same. If we want the sample size for estimating a difference between population means, we would just multiply this number here by two because we have to get two samples in order to do that. And if we want a sample size for estimating the difference between two proportions, we basically take this same piece here, the z multiple over b squared, and we multiply it by this p1 estimate times one minus p1 estimate, plus p2 estimate times one minus p2 estimate. We're combining the two estimates together. And using this formula, and again, there is an Excel spreadsheet that will give this to you uh, that I created in the Excel files that you can plug in the numbers to compute what you need. And that is it for chapter eight.
Uh, I'm glad five of you showed up. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? Yeah, we're here. <laughs> I know that was a little here, fast. Here. The online pieces are a little bit fast. You know, it, it could be a normal class if you stop me, if you have questions. Um, does, I'm going to assume head is just spinning. Hey, Trevor, thank you for the head spinning there. Do you have a question? And by the way, I recorded this. So I will post this on YouTube and send it as a link for you as well. Is that okay with everybody? I really needed to add, I, I really should ask everybody at the beginning, but since nobody said anything, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I'll take a question about the homework. Let me pause this though. Uh, I'm going to...